presidency of Andrew Jackson. You can see some of his many nicknames listed below. Old Hickory. He got that from the Battle of New Orleans, where he was as tough as Hickory. He was also known as King Andrew I. As you'll see, he makes very wide use of executive power, and thus it earns him title of king and the hero of New Orleans. Kind of bland in comparison to the other two, but, you know, you can't really complain when you got nicknames. So, as you know, Andrew Jackson ran for president unsuccessfully in 1824, and he lost in what he called a corrupt bargain. Um, the election went to the House of Representatives because there were four candidates, and no one candidate got a majority of the electoral votes. And Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House and also one of the candidates, threw his weight behind John Adams because he believed that Someone who had killed 2,500 Englishmen in a battle was not exactly fit to be president. So Clay throws his weight behind Adams, Quincy Adams becomes president, and conveniently, Henry Clay becomes John Quincy Adams' secretary. Corrupt bargain? Hmm, maybe. I think so. So Jackson screamed bloody murder, corruption, and blah, blah, blah. But then he would get his day in 1828. And that was quite an election, let me tell you. There were tons of scandals surrounding this particular election. Um, Jackson's enemies dredged up an old story that he had lived in adultery with his wife, Rachel, before they had been legally married. Um, they had actually been married for two years in the mistaken belief that her divorce from her former husband was final. But it wasn't. Scandalous. So Rachel was a bigamist and then had to actually make her divorce official. And as soon as she did, she remarried Andrew Jackson, um, but his opponents didn't really care about that small fact. So they smeared Rachel's name throughout the entire election. And shortly after taking office, um, the anxiety and humiliation that Rachel suffered as a result of her name being dragged through the mud actually killed her. She died, um, and Jackson was just so distraught. He said, may God Almighty forgive her murderers, as I know she forgave them, but I never can. And Jackson pretty much blamed Henry Clay for the death of his wife um, and, and the mudslinging. So not exactly a great way to take office. So one of the... Uh, unique features about the election of 1828 is that Jackson is supported by a brand new coalition of voters. Um, you have the planner elite in the South. They support him. You have the people in the frontier, uh, state politicians and immigrants in the city. So you can see this is kind of a hodgepodge group. Um, they don't exactly have a lot of things in common with each other, um, but they believe in Andrew Jackson and they believe in the Democratic Party that is forming under Jackson. So one of the things notable about Jackson is that he displayed this faith in the common man. So Jackson was you know, born very poor. He was an orphan in a log cabin. And so many people felt that he could really relate to their everyday problems and stresses. Um, he had an intense distru distrust of the Eastern establishment monopolies, anyone who was given special privileges, and he himself championed the plain folk, that he could talk normally, he wasn't too smart for his own good, and he understood the average Joe. Um, and he believed that regular people were capable of very good things if they put their mind to it. Here are um, the turnout rates for some of the elections we'll be studying. So you see 1824 there, and if you notice, in 1828, the election um, turnout rate actually doubles. Um, and this is particularly incredible. So what made the election of 1828 so interesting or significant that the turnout doubles? Well, what was happening all across the country is that states were um uh, easing back on their voting requirements. So now, for example, um, you could vote if you didn't own land. And so the easing of voting restrictions kind of reflected the feeling on the parts of workers, artisans, and small merchants, as well as farmers, 
that a more democratic ballot would help combat the rising influence of commercial and manufacturing interests. And really by 1830, only six states require white males to own property to vote. So the easing of these restrictions meant that four times as many people voted in 1828 um, as had voted in 1824. And so by gaining access to the political process as voters, propertyless white men encouraged a new type of politician who identified with the values and desires of the masses. And so to have been born in a log cabin and be a common man wearing a coonskin cap rather than a powdered wig um, became a huge advantage during the Jacksonian era. So you can see here the results of the election of 1828. Um, there is no dispute. Jackson easily wins both the popular vote and the electoral college. Um, and the political gravity of um, or the political center of gravity is moving west as the population is moving west during this point. And John Quincy Adams bows his head in defeat and he goes on to serve his state, Massachusetts, in the House of Representatives. So under Jackson, the Democratic Party forms, um, and under Jackson, we have the crystallization of the two-party system. We have the Democrats and the Whigs. Um, a new style of politicking comes about, and this included the use of political machines. And these machines used a network of employers and landlords to help party members find jobs and housing. And in return, they could expect their members to vote without question for the candidates designated by the machine. So a little tit for tat here, um, and certainly corrupt. If the machine gave you a job and somewhere to live and you didn't show up to vote on election day, you could bet your bottom dollar that someone was showing up at your house and making the very strong suggestion that you and your family turn out to vote that day or else. So citizens in the age of Jackson also start kind of changing their view of government. Um, they actually start looking to the government to solve their problems. So, you know, what to do about the Indians, what to do about canals and roads. Um, instead of taking these problems on themselves, the citizens actually start looking to the government and Jackson um, to deal with these problems for them. And the Democrats as a party um, in general oppose tariffs and they oppose the banks. Um, those are their big issues. So to the victor go the spoils. So if you're the wiener or the winner, you get to bring your people into office. That's what happens when you win. So Andrew Jackson rolls into office and he replaces all of Adams's appointees with his own supporters. And a lot of people cry foul and say that this is extremely corrupt. But hey, if you win the election, you get to bring your peeps. I mean, that's just how it is. Um, and Jackson's cabinet is a house divided. Um, Secretary of State Martin Van Buren is pitted against Vice President John C. Calhoun. And each of those men kind of jockey against one another um, to try to get the position of heir apparent to become kind of the next anointed one uh, who would become president. So they have a lot of disputes amongst each other trying to kiss up to Jackson and, and get his approval. Um, Jackson himself relies on what he called a kitchen cabinet, a small group of advisors that he relied upon for advice. Um, and one of the main tenets of his presidency is that he tended to veto um, all federal aid to local projects. So roads that would just be in one state or a canal that would just be in one state, um, he did not favor. He only wanted to use federal aid to projects that would be in multiple states and affect and help multiple people. And in fact, Jackson actually uses the veto more than any other president before him. And that's one of the reasons why he gets the nickname King Andrew, is because he really asserts executive power. The Peggy Eaton affair, more scandal, rocks the Jackson household. So Peggy Eaton is the daughter of a tavern keeper, and she also happens to be the wife of Jackson's secretary of war. Um, and both Andrew and Rachel, before she died of humiliation, um, really liked Peggy Eaton, but things got out that Peggy was a little too friendly, if you know what I mean, um, and so her affairs got out into the public, and of course it was a huge scandal, because back then that was, you know, absolutely no, 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 um, and so the president, however, stood behind Peggy Eaton, and he gave her her support, but it wasn't enough to save her social standing. She was still being shunned at dinner parties. No one wanted to talk to the whore, Peggy Eaton. 
So even though she was a cabinet member's wife and she was entitled to, you know, some civility with that position, the wives of the other cabinet members turned their nose at Peggy Eaton. They didn't want her sluttiness to rub off on them. And so they refused to accept her at their parties or even talk to her. This made Andrew Jackson completely furious because he wasn't all about, you know, social graces and, and keeping airs about oneself. So he demanded that his cabinet members make their wives accept Peggy Eaton. And anyone who's ever been married knows that you can't make your wife do anything. So the cabinet members were quite unsuccessful. And so Jackson asked for the resignations of all of his cabinet members except for one. So in the beginning of the 1820s, the American economy is facing a downturn. Um, we have the Panic of 1819, um, and the failure of the Second Bank of the United States causes the economy to spiral downward. The passage of the tariffs of 1828 and 1813 um, to promote stimulation of the northern state's economy also starts to hurt the South. These tariffs were similar to the one in 1816. They placed a tax on imports to protect American products. So the 1828 tariff caused a lot of conflict. Um, the southern states could buy manufactured goods cheaper from foreign countries than northern states. They had trading partners in Europe who would sell them finished products, and then Europe would also buy cotton from the southern states. And so the South ended up calling the 1828 tariff the Abomination Tariff, um, and they plotted revenge because this protective tariff, sure, it was helping the North, but it was really hurting the South. So in the beginning of, um, whoa, this is a duplicate side. I'm so sorry. We will move on. No, it wasn't duplicate. I just pressed the up arrow instead of the down arrow. Sorry. I'll get that right. Okay. So like I said, the South was really upset. So they proposed something called nullification. And this is led by former Vice President John C. Calhoun. Um, and with nullification, John Calhoun decides that the South can nullify the tariffs. The southern states claim that they're sovereign states, meaning they can rule for themselves. And it was these states that actually gave up their power to the federal government. So the federal government only has power because the states gave it to them. So that means that the states can have the last word on anything the federal government does, according to this nullification proclamation. I mean, this is all bogus, right? This is why we left the Articles of Confederation and created a national government. But this is the only way that Calhoun can kind of get around, you know, the tariffs. So the states claim they're sovereign. They gave the federal government the power that it has, and they will have the last word on the tariffs. So they decide to nullify the tariffs because they're hurting the South. And they declare that the tariffs are unauthorized by the Constitution and violate the true meaning and intent thereof and are null, void, and no law nor binding upon this state. Well, imagine how old Hickory is going to react to that. He doesn't. Not very well. So Jackson responds, Even though he's a huge advocate for the common man, I knew that such blatant disregard of authority would tear the Union apart if he was allowed to continue. He would not back down before South Carolina. No one was going to show up King Andrew. So on December 10th, 1832, he issues a procl proclamation that completely disputes the state's right to nullify a federal law. He says that this is silly talk. Um, but fortunately, Henry Clay steps in, member Jackson's old enemy, and he saves the day. Um, he comes up with a compromise for the tariff, which makes the southern states happy, makes Jackson happy, and it reduces the rate of the tariff for the next few years. So the nullification crisis kind of ends here. Um, but of course, this notion that states are sovereign and they can have the last word on, say, slavery, um, really kind of foreshadows the civil war that's about to, that's about to come. Well, Jackson isn't done. He's not going to rest. He's looking for another battle to fight, and he finds one with a national bank. Um, and you can see him here doing battle with Nicholas Biddle, and he is the president of the Second Bank of the United States. And Jackson hated the bank. He felt that it represented the rich, wealthy interests. Remember, he's a champion of your average Joe, your, your, your Jane Doe. You know, he wants everyone to be able to have a shot at success, and he believes that the bank only helps to serve 
the wealthy elite in the country. And so he is determined to take it down. So Alexander Hamilton's Bank of the United States, if you remember, operated for 20 years, but it died just like Alexander Hamilton. And then it gets rechartered um, under James Monroe. And so in 1832, Henry Clay decides to recharter the bank another four years. And, but he does this to set up Jackson because Clay knows that Jackson hates the bank. And so if he makes a proposal to recharter it for four years, he's going to put Jackson in a very sticky position. So the bill passes very easily and Jackson vetoes the bill and says it's completely unconstitutional when really that isn't his job. That's the Supreme Court's job to decide whether or not it's constitutional. So Jackson wins re-election quite easily in 1832, and he kind of sees this as vindication from the American people that he should go ahead and start dismantling the bank. Well, he can't just decide or declare that the bank is going to be destroyed. So what he does is he begins to withdraw funds from the bank, and since the bank has no money, it then eventually goes out of business. Quite, e quite an easy plan, right? Very simple, but very cunning. And obviously, extremely successful. Now, Jackson has rid himself of the bank. He now has to rid himself of the Indians. So Jackson's Jane Doe and, and, and John Doe, you know, they all, the common guy, they want to move out west. They want to be prosperous. They want to be successful. They want to pull themselves up from their bootstraps and be successful Americans. And Jackson wants to help them. So what are we going to do about these Indians that are sitting on the lands in the west that the Americans want to conquer? So President Jackson wanted the fertile land occupied by the five civilized tribes in the southeast, the Cherokee the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole, he wants them, oh, and the Creek, can't forget about the Creek, um, he wants them all gone so that his common Americans can have their chance at the American dream. I mean, who cares about the Indians, right? They're not real people. So he authorizes the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and this allows Jackson to forcefully remove the Indians of the five tribes um, to what we now know as modern-day Oklahoma. Well, the Cherokee Indians, rather than uh, sharpening their axes and their tomahawks and getting their bows and arrows, they actually take an interesting route. They file a lawsuit with the Supreme Court, and it becomes known as Worcester versus Georgia. The Cherokee Indians, believe it or not, are from Georgia. Hey, aren't we in Cherokee County? Ha <laughs> ha! So the Cherokee Indians actually win their court case. John Marshall, Molder of the court, the chief justice at the time, he agrees that the Indians have the right to the land. But Andrew Jackson's like, yeah, not so much. I want them gone. And he proclaims, well, Marshall has made his ruling. Now let him enforce it. Knowing full well John Marshall is an old guy in a black robe. I mean, what's he going to do? He doesn't have a police force. How is he going to stop Andrew Jackson? He can't. So Jackson really kind of diminishes the power of the Supreme Court as he completely ignores the court's ruling, and he himself forcibly removes the Indians from Georgia, and he marches them down what becomes known as the Trail of Tears. Um, and it's known as the Trail of Tears because one out of every four Indian on the trail actually dies. Um, so it's a really, really sad, terrible time in our history. 15,000 Cherokees march from Georgia to Oklahoma, and 25% of them never make it to their new home. So then we move to the election of 1836. Uh, King Andrew decides not to run for a third term. So he steps down and he picked his um, successor, which ends up being Marty, Marty Van Buren. Um, and he struggles uh, quite a bit. Um, he really lacks the full support of the Democrats. Um, there's a rebellion going on in Canada that threatens to pull us into war. And there's a huge economic depression that takes place because, you know, Jackson had to go around and, and kill the Bank of the United States. So it's very difficult um, to regulate the economy. So Van Buren is a miserable failure. Um, and then we move to the election of 1840. And his failure to cor correct the economic issues really tarnishes him with the voters um, and he has a very hard time um, trying to win votes. In fact, Van Buren is so hated by the voters that they actually come up with a slogan. And they say, Van Van is a used up man. Gosh, 
how do you compete with something like that? So um, he loses terribly, um, and he goes down to a vote of 234 electoral votes to only 60. So the Whigs run William Henry Harrison. Remember him? He is known as Tippy Canoe, remember, because he was the hero at Tippy Canoe. Um, and his running mate's named Tyler. So their campaign slogan is Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. I mean, how can you not win with something so incredibly catchy? Okay. And he's also known as a common man. Um, he's associated with log cabins and hard cider. And this is actually really funny because Harrison sprang from one of the first families of Virginia. He was a college graduate and he lived in a huge Ohio farmhouse. So nothing could be further than the truth that he was born in a log cabin and sat around and drank hard cider, which was kind of the beverage of choice of the common man. So he easily wins in the Electoral College. Like I said, it wasn't even close. 234 um, to 60. Now, Harrison's kind of old at this point. And so in order to prove that he, in fact, is a vile, strong president, he has the brilliant idea of giving his inaugural address in March when it's freezing in Washington, D.C. for two hours without a coat. He gives the longest inaugural address in the history of the country, two hours, and it is below freezing out there in Washington, D.C. The wind is whipping, and this man doesn't have a coat. He doesn't even have a hat. He doesn't even have a scarf. I mean, imagine if his mother were still alive. She'd be horrified to see him out there. So as a result of him trying to prove that he's a big, strong man, he catches pneumonia and he dies within one month of assuming the presidency. So sad. History, again, is so amazing this way. You can't even make these stories up. So his vice president, John Tyler, who they kind of just threw onto the ticket, was really never supposed to become president, finds himself as president. Um, and this man is highly incompetent, and most of his presidency is pretty much a very difficult power struggle between his philosophy of states' rights and the Whigs, um, because uh, Harrison and Tyler run as Whigs, um, and the Whigs um, favor states' rights, but Tyler is not exactly a huge fan of states' rights, and so he kind of comes into conflict between um, the Whigs and the states' rights supporters. And so we will learn more about him and his miserable failure of a presidency later on. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure.